Hello everyone, I'm Livia Edeger and I'm the Deputy Director of ISEP, the International Society of Substance Use Professionals. I'm here with my colleague Carrie Hopkins Isles. She's the Deputy Director of ICUDDR, the International Consortium of Universities for Drug Demand Reduction. And it is our pleasure to welcome you to our very first ISEP ICUDDR joint webinar. And it's also our first webinar for students and new addiction science professionals. And um, today we've brought together a panel of experts um, who will provide introduction into addiction programs and further education in addiction studies. They will also talk about forming student organizations and professional networks and cover challenges and tips to getting addiction science research published in high impact journals. On behalf of ISIV and ICUDDR, I would like to thank our esteemed speakers who are here with us today from different parts of the world. Thank you very much for presenting today and for sharing your knowledge and your insights with our members. And at the end of today's presentations, we will have time for a short Q&A session. So uh, we invite you to please send us your questions. Uh, you can do that through the chat function on the GoToWebinars control panel. And for those of you who would like to re-watch the webinar or maybe share it with your colleagues, the recording will be available on our YouTube channel and on our website. And um, after the presentations, also right before the Q&A session, Carrie and I are going to talk a little bit about our organization. So you're going to learn a bit more about ICEP and ICUDDR. Carrie, over to you. Thank you. So good morning, good afternoon, and good night, depending on where you are. I'm Carrie Hopkins Isles, as Livia said, and I am honored to be here today as a representative for ICU DDR. I'm really excited about this collaboration. ICIP and ICU DDR frequently work together, but now we're kind of doing that more publicly for everyone's benefit. And I am honored to present our first presenter today, Dr. Beatrice Kathungu, who's a faculty member of the Department of Psychology at Kenyatta University in Nairobi, Kenya, and also a coordinator for ICU DDR in Africa. And we work closely on a lot of projects. And um, right now she's working on our implementation course in Africa, which is an amazing project. So I'm so glad to see you, and I know you will have a lot of great information to share with all of our participants. Thank you, Beatrice. Thank you, Kerry. Um, indeed, I'm very privileged to join you once again and to be part of this great, um, again, important moment for ICUDDR and ISAP. I'm happy to be part of this initiative yet again. It's exciting to see how far we have come as ICUDDR and ISAP. I'm also a founder member of ISAP Kenya, so I'm extremely excited to be part of this. initiative that we all are part of. This evening, I want to welcome all of us. We're going to be professionalizing what kind of available for us as young professionals, what is it that we can do with what we have, and where are the areas of uh, growth uh, as a career in terms of addiction programs. And that's really going to be the focus of my presentation this evening. And I'm really going to be reflecting on my own journey and the journey of my country in terms of the addiction programs and further education. But I've also thought about what's happening in other parts of the world, which I'm going to be sharing in this short presentation. And so the first question I ask myself and that we need to ask ourselves is why do we need addiction programs? I think the reality is, according to the UN ODC 2020 World Drug Report, we do have a problem. Over 269 million people used drugs at least once in the previous year in 2018. 35 million of them have substance use disorders and therefore require treatment. If you go to your regional levels, whether it's in the different continents or even the respective countries, you will probably discover that the problem is similar or as big as it is at the global level. Now, when we have such a problem, the next question we ask ourselves, what's the impact? We have a lot of negative impact on health at the individual level. We have got impact on family and community. 
There's lots of resources that he spent on trying to manage problems related to drug and drug addiction. There is a lot of issues of crime, including violence and corruption. We have got disruption of socio-economic, political, and cultural structures, and therefore we have reason to be concerned. Why do we think addiction programs is the way to go? We need to ask ourselves, these are programs for who? Who are these service providers that require these programs? What do they need to do? What kind of services should they be providing? What kind of settings are they working in? With what sort of clients? What sort of knowledge, skills, competencies, attitudes, and values do they require? These are critical questions we ask ourselves each time we think about addiction programs. The other important thing we have to think about is some of the activities that these service providers will be involved in. They include you know, issues to do with supply reduction, whether it's areas of addressing production of drugs, sale of drugs, trafficking, distribution, etc. We also have to think about demand reduction. We need to think about prevention programs. We need to think about treatment programs. We need to think about harm reduction. We have to think about research issues of policy and advocacy when we think about engagement in this field of demand reduction. Now, other specific activities and settings that persons working in this field may be involved in include prevention programs such as outreach, awareness creation, education programs, we can also think about family, community and wellness programs. We can think about working in school settings. We can think about treatment you know, centers, whether they are inpatient, whether they are you know, residential, whether they are halfway houses, whether it's within the criminal justice system where we have got prisons and other you know, correctional centers, whether it's hospitals, whether it's rehab settings, amongst many others. We also can think about policy and advocacy organizations. These are areas and settings where people can work. We can think of academia. We can also think about research organizations. Now, when we think about that, then we see the need to build capacity. We need to build capacity at the global level. We need to build capacity at the regional level. We need to think about the national level and also the very local context in which we operate. And that's why international organizations like ISAP, ICUDDR, UNODC, Colombo Plan, amongst others, have stepped up to try and collaborate towards um, developing capacity and empowering countries to build capacity for these different service providers to be able to work in these different settings. Now, what is it that we need to do? We need to think about the knowledge, the skills, the competencies, the values that are required to address drug demand reduction goals across the different settings we have mentioned. This can be done through capacity building initiatives, and these initiatives may be short term, they may also be long term. Now, when we think about short term, we are thinking about short term training programs. For example, we can have short courses, and wonderful examples include the Universal Treatment Curriculum or UTC, the Universal Prevention Curriculum or UPC, which have actually uh, been steered by Colombo Plan with support from INL, and which are now uh, pushed ahead by um, uh, ISAP, Kenya, um, ICUDDR, and the beautiful partnerships that they have with the different uh, academic and, and training organizations. We can also think about university-based academic programs, which is where ICUDDR really does come in very strongly. And we need to note that in the universities, we can actually have academic programs in related disciplines, touching on um, addiction studies, but we can also have standalone uh, programs. And that's where I'm going next, that those who are young professionals or young people interested in pursuing uh, the career in addiction, then these are your options. You can actually look at universities and they have got certain programs that are related, which may actually have anchored certain courses in addiction. For example, you may find a program in psychology that has got a course, a single course or unit that is talking about addiction. You may also find a program maybe in uh, something like a clinical psychology that has got a group of units or courses which is forming a concentration or a specialization in the area of addiction. So it's possible wherever you are that you could possibly actually begin to um, you know, familiarize yourself with addiction related programs through these related disciplines. They could be in medicine, they could be in psychology, they could be in counseling, they could be in pharmacy, social work, public health, amongst others. And I believe if you look around your 
the universities in your countries, you will be able to see some of them. But the other important area of development is where we have standalone academic programs in addiction studies. And this is where ICUDDR is working very hard to actually build capacity of universities and institutions towards developing such programs. Currently, you'll find them in some universities. You will also find them in some of the middle level institutions. The other important issue we want to think about, what do these programs focus on? They could focus on prevention. They could focus on treatment. They could focus on harm reduction. They could focus on policy and advocacy. And some could actually combine elements from each of these. Uh, the other important thing is what kind of programs do we have? Some of them focus on coursework. Others have got coursework and a research component, including some project work in the area of addiction field. Others also add a practicum or internship to give the students a practical experience or a hands-on experience in the work that they are doing in the training program. Now, what are some of the names you will find going in this program? Some may be called you know, programs in addiction medicine. Others may be called programs in addictology. Others programs in addiction science. Others use the term addiction studies. Others use the term addiction counseling. And all these are examples of names you may find when you're looking for programs to pursue. I think the key thing is that the different names could really be portraying the emphasis or the focus of the specific program. Now, the other important question is, where do these um, programs draw students from? They cut across diverse disciplines, for example, medicine, psychology, very popular, sociology, pharmacy, public health. I have also seen some even cut across areas like law and criminal justice. So it means that we have a lot of openings in terms of the diversity of the background we are coming from to join the addiction field. Now, in terms of levels, we can have levels ranging all the way from pre-bachelors, where we have got certificates and diplomas. They go by different names in different countries. For example, some countries will call them ordinary diplomas. Others will call them higher diplomas. All these are terminologies that refer to courses that are done by people who have not attained a bachelor's. We also have bachelor's programs. We have postgraduate diploma for people that have a first degree, we, we, which usually run for about a year. We have got master's programs. We even have doctorate programs. And I'm happy that Anna is here because her university is one of the ones that has programs right from bachelor's all the way to uh, the doctorate level. Now, in terms of duration, it really does vary. It does depend on the program level. So that if you have a, a pre-bachelor's, it could be a shorter program. Bachelor's are longer. Master's could go until two years. But it really does depend on countries and regions. Doctoral programs could go for three years, some longer. So this may vary across countries and across regions. In terms of the entry criteria, it's diverse. It does depend on the level of the program. But it also depends on the uniqueness of the program. And it does also depend on the policies of specific institutions, specific countries and regions. The other important point is the modes of delivery. I think this is very exciting. What I note is the flexibility that we have. You can actually undertake your studies full-time basis. You can do it part-time. You can do face-to-face -face learning. You can actually do virtual learning where you have synchronous like we're having right now. Or you can actually have a synchronous where you can actually have materials posted in a learning management system and you can access it at your own convenience and at your own time. But we can also have the blended mode, which tries to integrate uh, the different modes of delivery. So as I end, it's now time for decision making. Are you interested in advancing your career? Are you interested in pursuing a course in addiction studies? These are some of the factors that you may consider. What are your personal goals? Your personal goals will determine the kind of choice you will make. Will you go for a short course? Will you go for a bachelor's program? Will you go for a post a doctoral pro, a post master's program or a doctoral program? Will you go for a short course? All this will depend on your personal goals and where you want to go. Secondly, what academic qualifications do you already have? Like I said earlier, different levels have different academic qualification as requirements. So you can look at your academic qualifications to be able to determine where you can be placed your financial resources. Of course, time availability is very critical. The admission criteria of the various programs. And finally, the availability of programs within your access points. But I want to note that with virtual learning now, we're going to be having borderless learning. 
where you can actually take a course across different countries, across different continents, because of the flexibility of virtual learning. Uh, finally, I wish to say that you have many available options. You may actually take a short course, you may do a pre-bachelor's program, you may do a bachelor's degree, you may do a postgraduate diploma, you may do a master's degree, you may do a doctoral program. In short, we are simply spoiled for choice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your inspiring uh, presentation, Beatrice. Um, and again, I would like to invite you all, if you have any questions for Beatrice, please send them to us in the chat function. We'll be able to ask Beatrice at the end um, in our Q&A session. Thank you, Beatrice. And I would now like to introduce our next speaker, Anna Volova. Anna is an academic and a lecturer at the first Faculty of Medicine at Charles University in Prague. And Anna is going to talk about student engagement. Um, student engagement has been a passion of hers for some time now. And Anna is the president of the Czech Association of Addictologists. And she has also founded the Student Association of Addictologists students in 2015. The floor is yours, Anna. Okay, thank you very much. I hope you hear, hear me, everybody. And I'm not sure I'm sharing the screen, so I'll just wait a moment. Yes, we, we can see, we can hear you, we can see you, and we can also see your presentation. Okay, I can't, I can't see my presentation, so I'm just trying to find it. Okay, I'm sorry for a minute. Okay, show my screen. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm having some trouble to see my presentation, so that's a bit challenging. Oh, okay, I see it now. Okay, sorry for this. So thank you very much uh, for uh, a perfect introduction. And thank you very much, uh, Beatrice, uh, for talking about the addiction study programs, because that is quite important for me to uh, link to the topic of uh, forming a student professional network. Uh, so, as it was said, uh, I am very enthusiastic into uh, student activities and student professional networking. And maybe what's important to say is that um, I have studied uh, our addiction studies here in Prague, uh, which as uh, Beatrice has already said, we have the bachelor's degree, the master's degree, and now I'm studying the PhD uh, doctorate. So. Uh, from this view, I would like to talk a few minutes about uh, what was going on and what is happening here in Czech Republic. So in a way, I would like to show you how it is in our country uh, to show you a case study of our student networking here. And I would like to uh, make some uh, conclusions in the end uh, that could be helpful for your study programs and for your experiences. Uh, so at this picture, I just wanted to show you that this is a picture of uh, it's a few years back uh, of our student association, which we have founded here. Uh, the question uh, I was actually asked to talk about is how students can work together to form, form a professional network, uh, which is a wonderful question. And when I was thinking about it, I was thinking, well, you know, students always want to stick together. It's something that students do all over the world. And it's just uh, how we look at their uh, motivation and how we work with it. So uh, I know it's the beginning of the presentation, but I wanted to highlight a few points that I would like you to take home. Uh, the first one is, um, okay, my presentation has just stopped again. I'm sorry. Okay, is Olivia there? Can you help me please just show the presentation? Great, Anna, yes, Olivia will, will share it. Okay, thanks. Yeah, this is something that happens very commonly. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Okay, so here are some points that I would really like you to uh, take home with you. It's that developing and supporting a student network is really worth it. 
uh, I will talk about it in the next slide, that we have founded or established a student network here in, here in Czech Republic, and it's just some wonderful things that have been done. I also, the second thing I want you to know is that you will always find students that are motivated to do big things. Uh, so this is something that sometimes I can hear from my colleagues from different countries that there are no students, nobody wants to do anything, but that is really not true. There's always at least a few students that want really to do something with, the, with their field. The third message is that you will also always find some teachers or some presenters of the academic society that want to support good things uh, students doing. Uh, so this is the other point of view that sometimes I talk with other students and they tell me, well, you know, we would really like to do something with the field. We just are really love it and want to uh, give information into the world, but we can't really find partners. And I always tell them, well, you know, try to ask. That, that's not true. I believe that you will always find somebody. Uh, the fourth message which is that uh, we have some kind of an example of practice here in Czech Republic. Uh, the fifth message is that uh, actually the quality of program uh, of the study program grows with the activity of students. And this isn't something from my experience. Actually, many studies have been done to support uh, this sentence. And the last thing I actually wanted to link uh, to the last presentation today is that uh, the motivation to publish uh, really grows when there is a good social support via a student network. So these are the six messages. Now, uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, so this is something that we have created here in Czech Republic. Uh, this is the Czech name for it. It's the Czech Association of Addictology Students. Uh, as I said, we have uh, established this body six years ago. And you can go to the next uh, slide, please. Thank you. And all this boom actually happened in 2015. And as I said, what was at the beginning? It was just a few students that wanted to do something important for them because, uh, you know, when you decide to go uh, to study an addiction study program, uh, you do have some kind of motivation. It's actually not really a coincidence you're doing so. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that uh, we actually have um, met a good supervisor, actually a teacher, uh, a presenter of the academic society who had a vision. So this is the second uh, very important point uh, that there always has to be a person that supports the student activity, that has some kind of vision. Uh, that sees a few years later and and supports this activity. And the third thing that happened was that there was a load of energy to go through a formal process. Uh, when you form a student network, it of course can have uh, many kinds of, um, uh, it can look different ways. It really depends on your country, on your system, uh, on your faculty. Uh, so here in Czech Republic, uh, there is a little tradition of student networks uh, throughout the fields, but not so strong. So we actually decided to really register uh, the student society as a nonprofit body. Uh, this isn't anything necessary and I won't go into it so much, but just for you to know that this was uh, some decision making that we had to do back then. And it was very important for us to have the supervisor. Okay, next slide. So I tried to identify the main benefits and this was uh, quite tricky for me uh, because I found much more than just five of them. But what is important? What happens when you have a student uh, society or association at your university or at your study program? The students really get to strengthen their competencies. Uh, we have organized hundreds of events, uh, of uh, sessions, of lectures. Uh, we learned communication. Uh, we learned what, what does it mean to uh, be in leadership, uh, that you have to cooperate. All these, we can maybe call them soft skills, is something that you really enhance uh, when you have a student body. 
The second thing is that students build relationships quite normally actually, but if there is a student network, uh, the relationships get stronger and they get stronger um, also not only in the field of addiction studies, but you have to cooperate with different students because you want to cooperate with different students. And this is something that really creates very important relationships in future. Uh, you also build a relationship, that's something I wanted to highlight, uh, with your uh, professional group, though you are still a student, you're not the professional actually yet, but it's something that links you uh, to other professional bodies. For example, here in Czech Republic, we have a National Association of Addiction Professionals, uh, which we have for like 15 years now, and it's a very important body. And if we have the student uh, association, we link it to this professional association and it really uh, rises the motivation to be then into into the professional body which is important because of advocacy policy and so on the third benefit i have identified is the interdisciplinary cooperation i have also talked about it a little bit more uh, but it means that we made lots of events, uh, or for example students uh, made these events when they went to different faculties and they talked to students from different fields and they talked about addictions, which was really awesome and wonderful. Uh, also, um, you make this basis for your future work, uh, interdisciplinary or the, or the multidisciplinary characteristics of addiction studies is very important. The fourth benefit is that you improve the quality of the study programs but not only of the study program itself, but of course of your teaching techniques. Uh, you, the, actually the faculty or the teachers um, have a partner with which they can talk about the quality of the study program and find ways to improve the study program. Wonderful thing. Uh, the fifth benefit is uh, creating opportunities. Uh, many students that went through uh, this uh, Czech Association of Students actually uh, made some good experiences in uh, going to conferences, going abroad, uh, cooperation with uh, future colleagues. Um, uh, some of our students actually <laughs> got very good job offers because they volunteered in uh, some of the events, some of very important events and it really helped them to get uh, to uh, good quality practice and uh, to get a job, for example. So this is just a hint uh, what benefits uh, a student network can bring. And can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, this picture is just that I'm not talking about nothing. Um, it's just a few photos throughout the years uh, that students have been doing at our university. Um, it really strengthened uh, the relationship between teachers and students. So uh, we also had this student journal. Uh, it was <laughs> like a, a testing journal or a practice journal. It was um, if anything that the students wanted to say to the world, they could just you know write uh, write their opinions there. And because it wasn't officially uh, a journal of the faculty or the university, uh, it was it was uh, very free. Uh, but I think it was a good uh, place uh, for trying to uh, write the first texts and articles, uh, maybe for further publishing. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so the question at the beginning was how students can work together to form a professional network. But actually, I think what is important that uh, we have to think about how can also teachers or the uh, faculty members work together to support students in their professional growth, because one can't exist without the other. Um, if you would have just, you know, wonderful students, um, it would um, 
the thing that could happen is that it would be just you know big energy and then all the activity would end but uh, you can make some kind of continuity if uh, the teachers uh, support the activity of students so i think this is very important to see when you think about your students okay next slide so the last thing just to sum up three messages uh, you will always find a few great students that are very motivated to do big things, to do important things about their field. Secondly, you will always find faculty members, teachers that want to support uh, good things that their students do. And the third message is that the quality of the field grows with the activity of students. So that is really something that is worth supporting. And the next slide, thank you. And that is all my messages for you for today. Thank you so much. That was incredibly helpful. And I've seen personally, Anna, your passion about this and um, being able to, when I met you uh, in, in Czech Republic at your university to see the students who were there and the work being done. So thank you for um, you. practicing what you preach and for sharing that with us. We really appreciate that. So I'm excited to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Richard Pates, who I've worked closely with on a lot of different projects. We've frequently been, uh, I, I've been up at early in the morning getting ready to do presentations with him. And he is a consultant clinical psychologist and editor-in-chief editor in the Journal of Substance Use and helps us um, at ICU DDR to help our, our folks get published. So with that said, I will hand the floor over to you and thanks for being here. Thank you very much, Carrie. And I hope I get this technology right. Um, let me get the slide up and that's right can everybody see that is that clear um what i was asked to talk about and uh, it was lovely to be here is to talk about uh publishing publishing your important work and i was very encouraged by what anna has just said about um the work that goes on in, in prague i'm very impressed with the university the charles university in prague and i have met the students there and done some teaching there so i'm fully conversant with that but also her idea of having a student journal to practice writing stuff is actually really important um so this session is going to be called challenges and tips to getting addiction science research published in high impact journals a bit of a mouthful um i'm an editor and this comes from sort of many years experience as being an editor um if you can remember this um it's there is a book called publishing addiction science uh, a guide for the perplexed it's been edited by members of ice age who i am representing today but fortunately you can unload download it free at www isaje.net and that the whole book is is available free for you to download and that's a really useful guide for for publishing um one of the things that that the the reasons i wanted to talk about this or i like talking about this um is that you often get very good training in universities when you're doing your master's or your doctorate or even your bachelor's degree about the the the, the uh the methodology for science and how to do research but very rarely do people get taught how to write for journals. And there's a very different skill in writing your master's or doctoral dissertation than writing for publication. And publishing is very important, especially in the academic world. And I provide you with a few uh, examples here. It provides a forum for communication among scientists. So we can talk to, I can talk to scientists all over the world and we, we have a common uh, not language, but a common interest in the in the stuff that is published because it is published because it's there available for us. That's the intellectual standards for a field, so it makes it be uh, intellectually vigorous. Um, so it's the agenda for what to study, and and interestingly, this I guess the study of of um, addiction, or it wasn't always called that, has been going on now for probably well over 150 years. 
and I think the first journal, which was what is now called addiction, was originally called the Journal of Inebriety, in Inebriety, and that was first published in about 1885 or something. So it, it's a, a long, a long time. But all that that has changed over the years. It's changed in the time that I've been uh, um, uh, involved in in, in uh, addiction work. It provides an institutional memory for a field because if you think about it, especially now that we have all the advantages of, of the internet, is you can go back and find papers from years ago. So there is something which is actually very important that we can use to to, to build our work on. It brings information to the public. It, it makes the it it, it um, the public or, or the the uh, journals, popular journals or not journals, but newspapers do um, access the content of journals and they will report them. So you will have that that your work brought to the public if it's important enough. More importantly, it certifies that your your work is authentic. The fact that you have got your work published in a peer-reviewed journal, a high-impact journal, means that it is it is genuine, and it can advance your career. And certainly in the academic field now. Um, that's really important because often things like uh, progression and promotion will depend on publications uh, and certainly in the UK and I think in the US that's often one of the requirements for, um, for, for academics. So what do editors want? Well we want high quality work, we want work that is, that is good, we want originality. Um, what we won't publish is work that is just the same as something someone's be done elsewhere. Um, good methods, Does it, are the methods rigorous? Good fit for the journal. You'll find that each journal has its own style, so to speak. Um, so some my journal is very much a psychosocial journal, publishes psychology, sociology, epidemiology and this sort of thing. Um, whereas if you go to some of the more medical journals, they will be much more medically oriented. So you need to, to look at what you want, where you want to put it, and whether that fits in with that, your paper fits in with that journal. And mostly we want well-written papers, and that is really important because a well-written paper doesn't necessarily involve very complex language, and I much prefer language to be simple and straightforward, but it means to be clear, it needs to be clear and understandable. Get you right before you submit. It's a stage by stage process of writing and submitting your paper. So it, it is it is a, a process that you build upon. Um, the paper will only be as good as the content and the methods you have chosen. So, um, you know, if you've not got good content in there or you've got use the wrong methods, then it's unlikely that you will get it uh, uh, accepted. So think about that when you're planning your research. Remember to read the author's guidelines, which are on the website of every um, journal. And if you go onto the internet and, and, and put the name of a journal in, it will come up with their website and they will all have instructions for authors or author's guidelines. And these things are really important because it is actually, uh, it, 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 it will affect whether your paper will be accepted or rejected fairly quickly. Um, getting simple things wrong, like the referencing style or spacing or not anonymizing, etc., will delay the process and frustrate the editor. So, with referencing styles, there are two basic referencing styles. One is the Harvard or APA style, where you put the names in the text and then the full reference in the reference list, and the Vancouver style, where you put not a number by the point and then the number is the reference in the reference list. Spacing is important because it's very frustrating if you ask for double spaced papers to have single spaced papers which are hard to read and hard to insert comments into. Um, anonymizing is important because um, we like to send our papers out for review, blinded to the reviewers so they don't know who's written the paper. And of course, if your name is on the top of it or your institution, that, that won't be anonymous. And this one is a is a a joke, but it was actually said. It was actually said in Prague by one of my colleagues when we were doing a workshop there. Don't annoy the editor. Um, there are certain things that, that, that are very annoying if people haven't followed the guidelines, which are there and available. The common reasons for rejection at triage and triage is what happens when the you submit your paper and the editor or the editor and the editorial assistant will go through the papers and check on these things. Is it within the scope of the journal? If it's outside the scope of the journal, it will be rejected. 
a manuscript type unacceptable. And what that means is that some journals will publish qualitative research, quantitative research, case reports, reviews, meta-analyses, letters, case studies, etc. Some won't publish all this sort of thing. Some will only publish um, quantitative research. So check that they will accept the, the, the paper that you've written, the sort of the sort of paper that you've written. What I've already said ignores instructions to authors, and that is that can be very frustrating. Major methodological major methodological weaknesses, for example, if you've got too few subjects, um, or the methods you've chosen to um, to to run your research with are not um, sound, then that will clearly be a problem. Clear ethical problems, and the, one of the problems with our field is that, that we quite often can run into ethical problems. So, for example, um, when needle exchange first started in back in the early days of the HIV epidemic, um, I was working in a city in South Wales, and the local government officials said, "Well, we should give needle exchange to one city and not to another city, and see how the rates of HIV vary." And I said, you can't do that, it's entirely unethical. Or if you were doing a treatment with a certain drug or a certain process, you cannot leave people without, if they've come for treatment, you can't leave people without treatment. So we have to be very careful about ethics, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, if, it, if your paper is purely descriptive, parochial, no hypotheses, no conclusions, it's just a, a chat, it won't be accepted for that. It needs to have a, a point and, and, and um, uh, an understanding. If the statistical analysis is lacking, now this is not necessarily true for qualitative papers, but for quantitative papers, it needs to be there so you can you can evidence the, the claims that you're making. Or if there's nothing new in it, and one of the problems is sometimes you get papers, I mean, I get a lot of papers about college drinking in America, and I know this is part of the system that people do, you know, run experiments on their, their, their colleagues, but it is, um, I don't see anything new in it, so I'm not likely to accept that. Responding to referees reports. So you'll send your paper in. Um, the, the, the editor will send it out to referees that will come back. And it will be usually one of um, four decisions. It will be accept, um, major revisions, minor revisions, or reject. Now, um, one of the things you need to know um, is that the number of papers that are accepted as they are submitted is very, very few. I may accept one or two a year on that basis. Nearly every paper needs some sort of work. And however experienced the, the, the authors are, that they do need some, some, some help quite often. So when you respond to it, um, construct a detailed reply to the referees. Reply with numbered uh, sections corresponding to the referees' points. So when, the, when you go through the points and, and, and in, a good, in a good review, they will have the points listed in, in a numerical order or, or at least in an order that just makes it easy to, to deal with. Make revisions to deal with the major criticisms and explain where you've not dealt with the rest. I mean, sometimes you can't deal with them because sometimes it's a, it's a function of the sort of research. Um, describe each change you make and refer the reader to the relevant page in this revised manuscript. When you read a lot of papers, it's often very frustrating if you're searching for a, a change that you can't find. Highlight changes in the text of a different colour. If there are important or major changes, recommend that you are absolutely sure, recommended that you're actually sure or wrong. Present a polite, logically argued rebuttal. And it doesn't, it doesn't work to just say, oh, this isn't fair, I, my paper is good. But if you think that the reviewers have got it wrong, and sometimes they may have done, they may be less experienced than you, and the editor didn't know that, then they may, it's worth you challenging that and saying, hang on, there is a different way to, to, to look at this. Ethical considerations, what to avoid. Um, well, these are seven kinds of, of, of um, ethical considerations in, in levels of seriousness. Um, carelessness, for example, citation bias, so where you are only citing one side of an argument and not the other. If you've got in your introduction, in your literature review, you should cite uh, papers which also contradict your view as well as those that support it. So you have a fair, um, the, the person reading the paper has a fair understanding of the, of the issue. Understating things, not, not making them important enough or, or negligence, missing things out. Um, redundant publication. Now, this is a problem where someone has maybe done a PhD 
and um, has written several papers out of it, which is quite usual. But they make the mistake of using the same tables or literature review in in several papers without noting that there's a prior source. Now you can't do this because um, when your paper is accepted, it becomes the copyright of the publisher. It's not your copyright as the publishers. So if you just copy those tables, and even though you've invented them or you've you've drawn them, uh, or the lit written literature of you, you have to either make note of it and and so you so you reference that paper the first paper in your second paper or you change the order of the wording unfair authorship um and this used to be much worse i think that it is now i hope it's got better but failure to include eligible authors or honorary authors and what this means is that there's people who have taken part in your research um don't get um a mention as an author but people who may be the head of department or the professor expect to get an, uh, an authorship just because they're head of department. And I'm very strict on this. And when I had, when I was working in my units and I had students there, if they wrote a paper with me, I would usually make them the first author. They needed it more than me. And they always got their name on papers. And I certainly don't want to, to um, uh, include people who have not contributed to the paper. Undeclared conflict of interest. Um, you conflicts of interest can be that there's a financial interest or it can be um, a, a somewhere that you're working for it can be all sorts of reasons and, and conflict of interest doesn't mean that you can't publish a paper it just means that you must declare it and people it's very quite clear to why you've done that um, human and animal subject violations um, no approval from review boards or ethics committees every university should have a review committee for, for, for research and ethics committee and any research that involves animals or humans should have um, approval from that board and it's interesting that that when I was a student doing psychology back um, many years ago we studied social psychology and some of the experiments done in American universities which are wonderful experiments but these days you wouldn't get ethical approval for them because they, they put people under stress um, Plagiarism, reproducing others' works or ideas without, uh, without reproducing other ideas or, or works or ideas without um, acknowledge them or saying that they, they're your own work. Um, and that can be just copying paragraphs of things, or I have seen a paper which was made up entirely of, of um, different parts of different papers, which was entirely non-original. Um, it's not always easy to spot. But um, many publishers now have uh, plagiarism software, which will go through an article and um, test it against other articles and can, can often identify that it is um, plagiarizing. Other fraud, fabrication or falsification of data, misappropriation of others' ideas or plans given in confidence. And this may sound um, quite um, severe, but the, in fact, there is, there was a professor at the University in London who actually invented some of the data in the study and his students blew the whistle on him and he was sacked. So it's a very, very serious thing. And uh, there's a temptation to do that. And actually, if you go back in history in terms of things like the IQ scientific research, there was some quite a lot of falsification of data then. So that gives you examples of what to avoid. Some helpful tips. So this is just really, I said, it's no great science. It's it's just a, a way of helping you get your work published. Make sure you include a limitation section. Um, every every piece of research has some limitations, um, and it's not it's not something that you should be embarrassed about. But it's important that you say that what the limitations are, rather than the, the editor or the reviewer finding it. Um, make sure you read the instructions for authors and i tell that to people over and over again because they don't read it and it really is annoying if you have to send a paper back um when, when you know they have got the, uh, the 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 order or the references or that sort of thing wrong but this is one i think is really important and and i'm sure that, that the work that anna was talking about would reflect this get your colleagues to read your work before you submit it when you've worked long and hard on a piece of research and you've written it up and you've slaved over it, you may no longer spot the mistakes you've made because you're so used to it. 
and it's really useful to have people to do that. Just a friend or a colleague read it through and, and check those 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 um, those comments. Um, if your statistical skills are not good, get a get a colleague with good statistical skills to check your work. One of the problems now is that um, there's so many so many statistical tests available on SPSS or other uh, programs that you can plug your data into something and get a result, but it may be that you've actually chosen the wrong test or you may have under, misunderstood the, the, the what this test is for. So make sure if you're not clear yourself, make sure you get good advice. Don't make claims in your paper that the results do not show significant. I mean, people sometimes say, well, it's moving towards significance. It was practically significant. If it's not significant, it's not significant. So don't make those claims. Um, importantly, highlight the strengths of your paper and why is it important. I think that nearly all research is important because every research, every big research issue is made up of little bits of research that are adding together and make the big the big picture. So your work is important. Um, don't be modest about it. Make sure that in the conclusions and in the abstract you've, you've stated why your paper is original and why it's important to science. There we are. Thank you very much. Um, I will now close that. I hope. Yes. Thank you so much. I always learn a lot from listening to you, and I really appreciate your presentation. I bet a lot of people learned a lot. Um, I know that it's hard to synthesize it into such a short presentation, and I appreciate that. So. I want to thank all of our presenters and I'm going to move into a bit of a description about ICU DDR in case not everyone who has joined us today is familiar with what we do. And um, since we are in collaboration today with ISEP, we can kind of illuminate for you and highlight a little bit what's different between the organizations. So I get a lot of people who would like to join ICU DDR, and of course we welcome them. But what we need to clarify is that ICU DDR is a university or institutional membership. So when someone is joining ICU DDR, they're joining it for their, their whole university. And um, what we do then is when we have our university members, we do a lot of faculty networking, university networking. Um, Beatrice has helped us with role modeling for other organizations as has um, Charles University in Prague. So, you know, if you're a university who is new to the addiction studies work, for example, we have other universities who are maybe a little farther along that path who can help you. Um, so there's a lot of really powerful networking that happens to work together. And then we also promote research. So we have inter-university research and people who work together in this area. Um, training. So we do a lot of walkthroughs of the UTC, UPC throughout the world, regional. We have regional coordinating centers. So we work in all different regions. Um, to see what they need. What do the universities and the practitioners and everyone in those areas need for um, how can we support them? Um, so yes, we do a lot of different things on the university level and um, hopefully you'll be able to join us in some of the things that we do there to support the different goals of network development, research, education, university community outreach and advocacy. I didn't mention advocacy, but we know that um, advocacy is required in this field. And so that we can make sure that those folks who are struggling with the disease of addiction receive the best possible care. We start that up at the macro level of training that workforce and bringing it down. So I think that's enough about ICU DDR, Livia. Thank you, Carrie. Yes, so in contrast to ICU-DDR, ICEP, 
We had ISIP are an individual membership organizations. At the moment, we have 19,000 members who work in drug demand reduction around the world. And um, to our members, we provide access to training and credentialing with opportunities also to build networks, share knowledge, and learn from each other's work and experience. And we do that through our website, through our events, virtual and in-person, at the moment through our webinars, and through our national chapters and partner organizations. And many of our members and website visitors are actually students and early career professionals. And um, many of them are actually interested in pursuing further study and seeking funding for research ideas that they have, or they would also like to connect with other researchers and professionals. And for those people interested in that, I mean, I mean anyone really attending an educational institution or anyone attending training in drug demand reduction, we offer a student membership. And um, for our student members, we provide a variety of resources. We provide information and resources to support their ongoing professional development. We hope that at the end of the year, by the end of the year, we will have our new online learning hub with training opportunities live on our website. Our student members also gain access to student and early career networks to develop their professional standing. And they also um, are able to access job opportunities via our job board on our website. And we also um, feature those job opportunities in our newsletter. And uh, another great way for our student members to be more active and for also early career professionals is to contribute and to publish and share their work on our knowledge share and uh, in our networks as well on our website. And um, so, um, like I said at the beginning, I would like to invite all of you, um, if you haven't already, to become an ISIP member and you can do that on our website. You can apply for membership. Um, and yes, we look forward to receiving your applications. And now we will move on to the uh, Q&A session. Thank you very much to those of you who have sent us questions. Um, Carrie will now start with the Q&A session. Okay, so we only have a few minutes, but we got a few really great questions that we wanted to circle back to. Um, one is about, what are some institutions that offer doctoral studies in education or in addiction or bachelor's degrees, different levels? And so one exciting thing that we have at our website on icuddr.org is what we call a DASP. It's the Directory of Addiction Studies Programs. And I just put, um, well, I put it in the chat, but it looks like it's only going to organizers and panelists. So maybe Olivia can help me with that. Um, I want to give you all a resource that you can, okay, now it's to the entire audience. So here's a link um, that you can go to that is, we hope comprehensive, but of course, if, if you see that we're missing programs, let us know. We're continually updating it, but this is a um, resource for you. So if you are interested in a program, here's a great resource to use. You can filter it by part of the world you're in, by what kind of program you're looking for. So. And then um, the another question that was asked that I can quickly answer for you is about what um, Dr. Pates mentioned, and that is the resource for those who are trying to publish their addictions work. And um, we all, I have that link here as well. So if Olivia, if you can make that available to everyone, that would be great. And then, um, I guess we have, we're, we're butting up on time here, but for Dr. Beatrice, the question is, what is the best course or degree, um, one who's already a medical doctor, what would you suggest they take if they're planning to put up a rehabilitation facility and would like to be hands-on with their patients? Thank you, Kerry. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Thank hear. you. So that's a, a very uh, important question. Um, as I said, what is important? You have to look at your personal considerations, your personal resources, but what is also available. If you already have a first degree, you're a, a medical doctor already, you probably don't want to leave your field of uh, medicine practice, but you want to enhance your capacity. I always recommend considering a postgraduate program. You may want to
pursue either a postgraduate diploma or you may want to consider a master's degree, depending on whether your country regulations do a graduate program in the specific field of study. And so I think the option I think I would recommend would be a postgraduate uh, program. Um, whether it's a diploma, if you are in my country, I would uh, advise you to do the postgraduate diploma in addiction treatment science offered in my university. We actually have psychiatrists on board. We have clinical psychologists on board with already master's degrees. And so that's what I would recommend. But I would like to invite Anna to also um, add to that response because I know she comes from a university that has a course right from bachelor's to doctorate. So Anna, kindly. Thank you very much, Beatrice. Um, I would just uh, agree with you what you have just said. For example, at Charles University, we have the comprehensive model. And for medical doctors, uh, the doctorate program, the PhD program is open. I would recommend that. And also, for example, in our country, we have uh, the lifelong uh, learning system. So that means that for medical doctors, we have some series of specific courses. So that is something that uh, that would be a choice, uh, for example, here. So it really depends on, on your country and uh, the possibilities you have there. But uh, you can study our doctorate, uh, the PhD program in English at our university. So if you would be interested, just let me know. No problem to give more information about that. So we are slightly over time. So I just want to wrap up, but thank you so much to everyone who attended. Thank you to our presenters who were all amazing and offered such good information and dynamic pr presentations. Um, we, I just wanna mention that the recording is available so people can share it or look over again if there's things they missed. Um, also, you will be receiving a certificate for attendance. Thank you for that. And we do hope to offer more joint webinars such as this in the future. So if you have ideas on things you'd like us to offer, please let us know. Um, I think it was a great success and I'm really proud of it. So thank you to everyone and take care. Thank you. Thank you so much.